We are in a state of emergency. Prejudice. Wrote a song about it? Like to hear it? Here it go. Free your mind. To boldly go where no man has gone before. I ordered this book, God is on Trial. I ordered this book from Amazon, and I must say I've read it. It's very well written, very thought-provoking. Okay, thank you for donating to uh, my uncle, Tali. Uh, I appreciate it, and I know that my family appreciate it because he's been on our lives for years now. So, yeah, and I just want to say thank you because, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, and we love you guys. Bye. Bye. He's forever and always. He's forever and always. He's forever and always. Operation Exodus, Mississippi. What is OEM? It is the only real solution for descendants of slaves born in America. The original Mississippi campaign. Anything else is fraud and will not work. It is the process of bringing into reality the promised land that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of. It is simply inspiring the so-called black residents of the state to take advantage of their voting power, having a large population to take control of the political systems, laws of their state, to benefit themselves, of which brings them power, power they never had before. OEM has nothing to do with religious, personal, or political beliefs, just wanting to make life less oppressive in this geographical area so blacks can feel safe and operate with less resistance due to racism, 
forming a type of safe haven sanctuary state for black people. OEM doesn't advocate trying to force the populace to do anything they don't wish to do, but offer advice and suggestions to improve their state for all citizens, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, etc. Some of the benefits of OEM could be, one, as a state, you could finally request reparations due to the enslavement of our ancestors from the federal government. Being such, monetary or other awards will not be going to individuals or groups, but a state now in control that benefits this people to help build what this people need to act like true, free, liberated, as well as equal citizens of this nation. Two, having control of the governor's mansion, you can control the state national guard as well as all law enforcement of the state. Three, create a different way of living among the people to alleviate homelessness and other poverty, requesting the citizens more modestly, opening up more jobs, more time with loved ones. Four, offer true rehabilitation to those in criminal systems so monies on jails can go to more beneficial purposes. Five, state can request the federal government to release all political prisoners in federal custody or those forced into asylum in foreign lands to be returned to or handed to Mississippi so they can live out the rest of their lives in dignity. Six, Mississippi will become a true work state where every man, woman, and child can say they had something to do with the success of their state instead of credit going to a select few. Seven, being an agriculture state already, we can specialize in the production of pure organic foods that is good for our citizens, also can be exported to other states and around the world, having a want for cheaper organically grown food products. Eight, success of OEM will become the blueprint and example, having not enough room for all who now wish to move. So our eyes must be set upon perhaps Alabama, Georgia, and the like. Nine, a state can function independently from the federal government forming relations and deals in foreign lands like Africa to benefit the state and nation. The so-called black people of America have never had true power that others respect. But by doing this, we will get the respect and power we have never experienced and the doors that will open due to just taking control of your life, we can't imagine. Please be reminded, if not for the domestic terrorism, targeting black people of the South and the federal government refusing to protect its citizens, forcing them to flee, this OEM campaign probably would have been made a reality generations ago. So all you and I will be doing is the work our ancestors wanted to do, but couldn't do, due to domestic violence from other citizens. Join and organize Operation Exodus Mississippi today, or become a supporter. op-ed columnist and author Charles Blow has penned a new book. It's called The Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto. It's a roadmap for overturning white supremacy, he says. 
He has moved to Atlanta, Georgia, after living in New York for 25 years. And he's now proposing that other black Americans up north do the same to boost their political power in key southern cities. Here's our Hari Srinivasan talking to him about why now and how it would work in practice. Christian, thanks. Charles Blow, thanks for joining us. The majority of the book is outlining an idea that is not a thought experiment for you. You're living it. Explain the proposition. The proposition is simply to return to the places where you were majorities or large percentages of the population to consolidate political power. Before the Great Migration, 90% of all black people lived in the American South. At the end of the Civil War, three Southern states were majority black. Uh, another three were within four percentage points of being majority black. Every Southern state had a large black populations. If black people had not uh, migrated, which is a big if, and if there, there was still the passage of the civil rights uh, legislation and the voting rights legislation, bit another big if, uh, it is conceivable that Black people today would uh, control up to 14 sentences. They could control um, more electoral college votes than New York State and California combined. Um, they, If they vote, o voted over that same period the way they vote today, there would not have been a Republican president in the last 50 years. That would mean that the, the, the Supreme Court would look completely different. I don't think there's a, a justice on it who was appointed over 50 years ago. Uh, this is a, you know, it would, it would have been a major shift in power and it can still be. The only thing that black people have to do, and not even all of them have to do this, but large numbers have to do what many, what smaller numbers are already doing, which is to return to the South. You want people to come back to the South in order to be able to exercise their political power better than what they have in the North? Right? Absolutely. There is no real power, political power, that Black people have in the northern states. How is that possible? We've, we've, we've. What does that mean? This is this is one of the the premises of the migration out of the South was, you know what, it's going to be better in the North. How is it that they don't have political power in New York or in California or in Minnesota? Because they're all diluted. So the Black percentage of, of California is about five percent. Uh, black percent of New York is about 15%, same in Illinois. Uh, so you are not going to deliver a state. You can be the additive uh, group when white people basically split down the middle. But you can't deliver a state on your own. You can't elect a senator on your own. New York has never had a black senator. Uh, New York, black New Yorkers have never delivered New York. It's still going to be blue whether black people are there or not. And, and, that mean, and that is with New York City having two million black people in it, more black people than any other city in America. And yet they can't produce, right? So you, they can't elect a black governor. There's only been one black governor, and that was because he was lieutenant governor when the, the actual governor got caught in a prostitution scandal. Uh, no black senators, the last two million people in the city, though, you've only had one black mayor in the entire history of the city of New York, and that was 30 years ago. And behind him came Rudy Giuliani, who's, who, who's tactics, who used racist tactics, and, and uh, Michael Bloomberg, who, who uh, was a champion of stopping kids. You know, at the surface, when someone looks at an idea like this, they're going to say, well, this is sort of the new Garvey. Is he, is he calling for black supremacy? Is he giving up on integration? Is this about yeah. self-segregation? Well, I would turn that glove inside out. For the last 90 years, every state in America except Hawaii has been majority white. No one says that that's a problem for integration or diversity. Uh, right now, as we speak, seven um, states in America are 90 plus percent white. Is that not white uh, supremacy or white majority or overwhelming? Is that not a problem for diversity? There are 40 million black people. There are only 10 million people in the entire, if you collect all those people in those seven states together, it's 10 million people. There are four times as many black people in America than in those, those seven states. But black people don't control only one senate, black, black senator, two senate seats. Also, if it's also elected by a, a coalition where black people were the majority. Uh, 
But how is that possible? Those people represent what, about 3% of the American population, but they control four senators and they're 90 plus percent white? People can't ask me questions about whether or not this is a problem ra about racial concentration and racial power until they deal with those seven states. Well, let's talk a little bit about sort of, let's say, brass tacks, right? So let's say, okay, all right, I'm signing up. Now I'm thinking to myself, what sort of incentives are there? What sort of economic opportunity is in the South? I mean, do we have, have we kind of frozen our idea of what the South is? Because one of the hesitations that people have is, I don't want to go to the South. Well, it's more racist there. There's less jobs there, et cetera. You've been diving into the data for all your research. What did you find? Well, uh, Forbes does a list, uh, I think every year. You know, I took was 2018, but that's when I started writing the book. Places where the black middle class is thriving. Half of that list is cities in the South. When uh, researchers look at where uh, black, where black owned businesses are most concentrated, the, the number one region for that is the Southeast. When you look at real gains in um, median family income, the South uh, ranks at the top of that list on and on and on. Uh, the black middle class is actually thriving in the South. Um, th uh, the other thing is about racism. Well, I asked people uh, at the imp Project Implicit, which studies uh, implicit bias during population, they've done like hundreds of thousands of these online tests. I asked them to cut their data to show me uh, racial bias, what they, track is anti-black pro-white biases. Um, show me those biases by region and by race. Very simple request. It was surprising to even them. There was no difference in the, in the amount of racial bias among white people from the South and those in the North and those in the Midwest, none. You know, there's a, a quote in your book that says, the supposed egalitarianism of northern cities is more veneer than core doctrine. It's a flimsy disguise for a racism and white supremacy that diverges from its southern counterparts only in style, not substance. Explain that. Well, uh, when I look at uh, the militarizing of the police, that is a northern and western city phenomenon, the supposedly um, uh, liberal cities. Right, the the you got the SWAT team from California because they were responding in part to the Black Panthers. That was the first SWAT team. Uh, if I look at uh, stop and frisk, that didn't start in Greensboro or Birmingham or Jackson, Mississippi or Little Rock, Arkansas. That starts in New York, exported to California and uh, Los Angeles and uh, Chicago. If I look at every police department right now that is under a consent decree with the Department of Justice because they have misbehaved and have violated people's civil rights. Only two of those are in the South. All the rest are in Northern and Western cities. The data, I, I don't understand why the people don't actually look at the data. When, when I look, you know, people look at incarceration rate. Mass incarceration is a huge issue for a lot of African-Americans. Uh, they always point to the South and say they incarcerate a lot of people. Yeah, but they also incarcerate a lot of white people. What you have to do is look at it and say, of the number of black people that you have, what percentage of those do you incarcerate? And when you do it per capita, the Southern states rarely even rank. Vermont is at the top of that list for black men. You brought up Vermont. That's interesting. In the book, you point out that Vermont is the result today of a rather drastic and short migration that began there, um, not dissimilar to what you're talking about, really, from an article in Playboy. Absolutely, and that was part of my inspiration for this book, because it worked so well. And, and during the Vietnam War, uh, uh, early 70s, uh, young hippies were uh, liberals, I don't want to call every, all of them hippie, but a lot of them were, that was not a derogatory term, uh, were uh, protesting against the war, protesting against the way Nixon was executing the war. But he was not budging. He, was ex he, would, he continued to execute it the way he wanted to. Two young uh, Yale Law students um, wrote an article in the Yale Law Review that, that said, you know, you, you can't, you're not gonna get anywhere this way, you can't have any kind of armed re uh, revolution, but you can do this thing we call radical federalism, which is to basically go, move to a small state, take it over. Uh, one of the smallest states, Vermont, it doesn't take as many people, move. 
Uh, and it kind of languished there for a, a few months until a writer picked it up and wrote an article in Playboy. And yes, people used to read Playboy for the articles because there were a lot of great writers uh, writing in Playboy. And he wrote an article under the title Takeover of Vermont. And after that, thousands, tens of thousands of young white hippies grabbed their things and moved to Vermont. And some of them had places to stay, slept in the fields, they created communes, but they transformed Vermont from one of the uh, most more conservative states in the union to now it is the most, one of the most liberal states in America. It is where you get a Bernie Sanders. It is where Barack Obama gets his highest percentage of the white vote in 2008. They basically changed Vermont from New Hampshire into Vermont. And that is the power of migration. We are not in the era of Jim Crow. We've repealed many of those rules. Why do we need now this influx of Black Americans to move to these places? And what impact will that have? Isn't the system working? It's not working. We have not repealed those rules. We've, we've, we've uh, forced the people who want the same rules to reinvent them in a more elegant form. We still have massive uh, 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 voter suppression. It's just in a different form. It's not a poll tax or it's not a literacy test, but it is, you know, all of the things that is happening right now in Georgia in response to the fact that black people were the majority of that coalition that delivered the state for Democrat. And now they're introducing bill after bill in the state legislature here in Georgia, trying to say, uh, get rid of uh, uh, no, uh, no reason um, uh, early voting or require two forms of voter ID, anything that they can do to make it more difficult for people to cast a ballot is exactly what they're going to do. And they know, and I know, and you know, that that disproportionately affects black people, brown people, college students, and the elderly who are poor. Uh, it is not that these things have gone away. And as long as you, you have state legislatures that are hostile to you, and that exists some in, in many ways across the country, hostile to you, you will never be free. Charles, you're also making right now in your last answer the case against moving to Atlanta or to Georgia, saying, hey, just we, even if we have more black people here, that doesn't mean racism stops. That doesn't mean the, uh, uh, attempts to disenfranchise me stop. I don't think that's an argument against it at all. If I'm not promising anybody uh, a utopia. If, if racial majorities and control of state power guaranteed utopias, every white person in America would be prospering because for the last 90 years, they've controlled the majority of states of Hawaii. But they're not all prospering. There's still crime. There's still poverty. There's still income inequality. There's still food insecurity. Those seven states that I mentioned to you, 90 plus percent white, surely all those white people are prospering. No, they're not. They're human beings. They have uh, problems that, 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 uh, uh, that accompany the human condition. If you go to the South and, create and, and by chance have a black majority, you will also still have the problems that accompany the human condition. There's no such thing as a, human, uh, as a utopia when human beings are involved. It is just that in the aggregate, people who um, uh, don't have to live under white supremacy are going to do better than those who do. And this is the only way for you to not have a space in this country legally, constitutionally, where you do not have to live under a system of white supremacy. Look, are you assuming that all black people will vote the same way? I mean, look, look at the elections in the last two cycles. I mean, you had large numbers of Hispanics, Asians, black Americans vote for Trump. I am not assuming that at all. And, and what I am very uh, uh, careful to say and want to be very clear about in all my interviews is black power is not political party power. I am not advocating black power for Democrats or so the Democrats will have more of an advantage or black power so the Republicans can get a foothold. Black power is for black people to not live under white supremacy, whatever uh, form that takes. You know, a hundred years ago, if you walked into any room in America, the majority of the black people in that room would have been Republicans. Democrats were the party of the racist, clear and simple, no doubt about it, the Klan and everything else. But the Democratic Party reformed itself, changed itself, and black people over the course of a century forgave the fact that they were the party of the Klan. 
you could have a future in which the Republican Party no longer sees a, a viable path to uh, national election and then starts to court black people the same way that the Democratic Party started to do. I don't know what the future holds on the political party front. Right now, the Republican Party, in my opinion, courts the races, which is a non-starter for black people. They just can't get with it. Uh, uh, but I don't know if that's be the future, but black power exists separately from a, a, a total alignment with any particular, particular party. So lay out uh, the distinctions between your proposal, which you say is based on anti-racism, pro-blackness. How is that distinct from black supremacy? How is the entire idea not racist on its face? Again, I go back to this idea, like, how is it that no one is saying that we, this is white supremacy that you have every single state except Hawaii, this majority white right now. And that is not a fluke, that is by design. People will run out of those states where they were from by white terror. They had majorities there. There, was, there were times when Native Americans were majorities of what would become states. And they were, run, they were chased west uh, uh, there were there was a time when some of the Western states had much larger percentages of Hispanic people. That was kind of their territory. So the idea that we, the American people, by design, chased people using white terror into spaces where now none of them have, or majority of the spaces where they would have been majorities anyway, that seems to be not a problem. <laughs> But advocating that black people might one day be one percentage point over 50 percent in a state, not 90 plus percent like those seven white states that I was talking about, just one percent over 50, that freaks people out. We have to interrogate why that sounds like a problem to people. Charles Blow, the uh, book is called The Devil You Know. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Keeps it real like that. I keep it real. To this guy, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, the answer, answer the question, Mr. Brown is yes. Matter of fact, did you uh get that? Uh, I don't know, I sent you something about this cult member from India, Raj Ranjib, I think his name was, in the around 1981. Uh, in the 70s, he was uh, he had a big cult in India, he had 100 Rolls Royces or something like that, right. and then, then they were trying to tax him because uh -huh. they said, okay, we're not calling this a religion anymore, so he wanted to keep his money. And then he moved to the United States. I think it was in Iowa, I think. And the reason why I said, damn, when I was hearing about that, I was like, that's something else because he's talking about what you're talking about, take over a, a city and a state. Yeah. And But he moved to, I think it was Iowa, uh -huh. some some small town in Iowa. See, but he did, number one, he had a lot of money coming with him and he had a lot of followers. So the whole followers came in, took over the town, uh, they, they got voted on the boards and everything, you know, so they were running the show. There were only like two white people left in the town uh, <laughs> who had any kind of power. Yeah. So they totally took over everything, police, every damn thing. Uh -huh. And then to the point where they even renamed the town after the guy, the cult yeah. leader. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, damn. Yeah. But then obviously they started taking it too far, started uh, increasing the taxes and then keeping most of the money mm. for themselves and all that kind of stuff. Corrupt. They corrupt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what did them in. Richard, you say that to me. I want to see that. 
Yeah, yeah, I, that was fascinating. I said, "Damn, it can be done." Yeah, but you you need some people. You can't yeah, go there with one or two people, though. No, no. He came with an army basically and took it over in no time. No time. And he's not even from this country. <laughs> so can you imagine if we could rally our people in Mississippi? We could take that. We could take it. We already are. We already have the numbers. We could take it. But my thing also is, once you are able to do that, now what you gonna do? You know, we don't want to go in there and be and fall all apart. Then everybody looking at you, and then the, the, the state of Mississippi is already in, uh, in poverty, poverty stricken state anyway. And then you come in there, take over, and make it even worse. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. We have to have some kind of plan of action. You have to have some kind of vision in order to to go in, be successful, and stay successful. Stay successful. So, so now. You know that it can work. It can be done. Now you can go on. We want Alabama. Now we want Georgia. And see, they begging for states. They begging for somebody to do something that you know they're not going to do. You're already in a position. Let's just go ahead and take it. You Use your vote. Use use your position. Use the, the tools that they give you and, and just take it. And yeah, once these people, they, they, they work the system, and yeah. then once they took it over, then they changed the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Which worked to their advantage, but they got too damn greedy. Right. See, yeah, we can't corrupt. They I think the tax, I forgot what it was, but they kind of increased the tax rate and other expenses like four times what it was. Uh, <laughs> and then they kept the uh the increase for themselves. <laughs> See, we're not we're not we're not talking to, uh, about that. Matter of fact, I'm I'm even talking about, you know, uh not telling nobody what to do. But we're asking that we would ask the people that live there and all those who live there that participate in this endeavor. We have to change our whole mindset. We don't want to live. Uh, we just want to live decent. We just want to live moderate. It ain't about all that because the money that we save by living moderate. Now you can invest that money in other things that can actually get your get your state rolling. And then when people see that you're successful, and they were coming in. Now you can create a support system so you can bring in other people so that they can enjoy the benefits of this activity that we're doing. We're not looking to be, uh, you know, mansions and, 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 and diamonds and all. You, your whole mindset has to be different. I'm not talking about we go back to, to living like the way I did when I was a child, but we have to, we're going to have to downsize. And downsize in a way where you can still be comfortable and we want to downsize and change things in a way where you don't work yourself to death. Maybe there's a, 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 a way that we can adjust the way that we work so that you, you don't have to do 40 hours a week. You have more time with your family. You know, things of this nature. It's just, you just have to figure these different things out. And we, I know we're smart enough, we can do these things. The main thing is able to, just to rally the people together to show them that this can be done and what is the benefit the benefit of having a state as a power base because as you know also if you're able to do that that means you we also control the budget of this state which could be uh, uh almost a, tri a trillion dollars what i don't know what the budget of these states are but anyway you whatever it is you could you'll be able to control uh that budget you control the school system you control the National Guard. You are in control. You making the laws. You can change the way those police departments do things down there. Of course, if we was in control, that thing in Mississippi with Parchment Prison, that wouldn't even be going down. We'd be straightening that up real fast with Parchment Prison. Oh, yeah, I found that guy's name. His name is uh, Rajneesh. Rajneesh. R-A-J-N-E-E-S-H. I can look that up myself, man. Yeah, I don't know how to put the uh, thing on here, though. Okay, R A what? R A J N E E S H. Okay, yeah, I look him up. But see, this is his other his other code name he used was O S H O Ashno. Ashno. You'll see him. This is a fascinating story, and I, I still can't understand. My man had his people totally under control with so much money. It ain't funny. I mean, a hundred Rolls Royces. See, that's just that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. See, that's not our attitude. That's not our mindset. We're 
we're trying to do something with us. In the, if that's what we're going to do, I mean, I would even, if that was my intent, I wouldn't even suggest nothing like this. I wouldn't even suggest it. That's not the intent. The intent is to put us in a, in a position so that we can get into this race game, so that we can be in competition with the immigrants that's coming in here and the rest of these folks, because we're, we're down by 500 years. So we need to do something big in order to get back into the race. We need we need that boost. We need that that extra jetpack to get back into the race. Otherwise, these other little things is nice, but they're not going to be able to get us into the into this game. You know, right, pan Africanism is not getting us into any kind no, of game. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because that's that's putting other people probably. That's why another thing. Because you commented on one of those shares that I uh, yeah. keep sharing with Africa, mm -hmm. and I keep doing that to prove a point mm -hmm. that. There are other people, Asians currently ruling certain African countries as we speak. There are white Asians in North Africa running the prime prize of Africa, Egypt, Carthage, mm -hmm. uh, the Moors, all those areas. That these mm -hmm. people are running the show. Mm -hmm. Whether the Pan Africans doing the Chinese, the, the Chinese are spreading their culture in Africa, and they got Africans dressing like them, trying yeah. to speak like them. Yeah. What are the Pan Africans doing about this? They, nothing. They, they can't do nothing because they don't have no power. They don't have nothing. Yep, and they're not doing nothing. And they're not doing. They can't do nothing. They they can go over there, take trips, and uh, charge people quite a bit of money to go and and taste some uh, 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 jollof rice and say, mm. right. "Search for you who wrote." That's what. It, that's yeah, right. that's all he does, man. Is go back and forth over there. Uh oh yeah, that BAI all is supposedly in a so-called beef. <laughs> they, they, in a, they in a beef now, supposedly. Uh between uh the Kayla Genesis and uh the uh whole <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that could be fake, but who, who knows? But see, yeah. but the point is they're not going anywhere if they were serious. Like I said, this is why when you had the Afghanistan war against the Soviets, yeah. Uh they said Muslims from all over the world volunteered their bodies. They went over there, they said we are fighting the Soviet Union. Yeah, they put their bodies on the line and they put their uh, money where their mouth is, mm -hmm. you know. But these Pan Africans, they're not doing nothing but visiting. They know they don't yeah. want to live in Africa. No, come on. No, Who, or you rather live in the worst housing projects in the United States than live in Africa? You know you would, unless you got some real money. Yeah, because you, you know the way. and be comfortable. Yeah, because you know average living in a given African country is probably. Not too much better than living in the projects. Truth be mm -hmm. told, mm -hmm. like you said, unless you have some money, some money, you know, 